Let's begin reading at verse 1 here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Beginning at verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul writes, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be defrauded? No, you yourselves do wrong and defraud, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Actually, it starts out rough, but the last verse is worth it all. That's what you were, but that's not what you are now. That's what you were, but God has done a work in you. And we will be closing with that happy note as we go through this chapter. But as we do so, let me remind you of a couple of things, things that we've already looked at, to lay a context so that we can look at chapter 6 with some clarity. We need to remember that in chapter 5, Paul has been writing and addressing a sin that was there in the fellowship at Corinth. It was a sin of sexual impurity. A man had been sleeping with his father's wife. And this is one of those sins that wasn't even spoken of by the Greeks. It was repugnant to those who weren't even believers. He said in verse 5 of, uh, rather verse 1 of chapter 5, this sin isn't even named among Gentiles. And the thing that is so grieving to the Apostle Paul is the response of the body of Christ, the response of the fellowship. Instead of them being broken, in, instead of them grieving over the sin, instead of them seeing it as being something that is really to be really ashamed about as, as, a, as a congregation, rather than having those kinds of actual real sentiments, and their, their response was one of arrogance, even pride. They actually had resisted dealing with the sin. They didn't really appreciate its severity. Well, it's been said, no sin is small. No grain of sand is small in the mechanism of a watch. There's no sin that is small. So Paul's concern was their attitude, their attitude of acceptance of sin, because an acceptance of sin, if you have sin in the fellowship that goes without being dealt with, it goes without being repented of, eventually what it does is it destroys the fabric of the entire body there. The church actually goes down. You see, the body of Christ is really the uh, pure bride of Jesus Christ. And as the pure bride of Jesus Christ, we're, we're to have lives that really reflect our relationship with God and the transformation that faith in Christ actually produces and the lifestyle change that occurs because we have come into contact with a holy God. God is holy, he expects that his children will pursue him in that and also become holy as we pursue him. As it says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, because it is written, be holy because I am holy. So as the bride of Christ, we are going to be united with him and therefore we prepare ourselves for the day that we're gonna see him and be with him and even as I was sharing today in our morning study, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, we have this sense of anticipation of being with the Lord, and therefore we prepare ourselves to be with him. And that's what John was saying in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, when he said, Beloved, now we, we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man who has this hope in him 
purifies himself even as he is pure. So, to intentionally disregard and ignore sin is to ignore the purpose of the death of Jesus Christ. Because Titus 2.14 says that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be eager to do that which is good because at one time we were eager to do that which was evil. That was our lifestyle. When I first got saved, I, I actually took my old form of life in one sense and transferred it to my new life. In my old form of life, if there was a party somewhere, we'd get in a car and drive as long as we had to till we could get to the party, and then I'd enjoy myself at the party. When I got saved, instead of saying, there's a party now in La, La Habra, somebody would say, there's a Bible study in La Habra, and bang, we'd get into the car and we'd drive there to do the same kinds of things in the sense of dedicating ourselves to a night, <laughs> and yet the night was entirely different because whereas before we were going to do some things that we ought not to do, I was now learning to do the things that I was supposed to do. And you have that heart to do that. So you don't tolerate evil, especially in yourself. Paul is dealing with sin in the fellowship. And uh, he had to deal with it in a way that he separated this individual from the rest of the church. Because he needed to be in a place to realize his sin and to repent and to return to the Lord. So he's been dealing with this, and now in chapter 6 he continues. And he's dealing with problems once again in the church. Now here, this is the sad thing that he's dealing with at the beginning of chapter 6. He's dealing with the problem of Christians who are actually taking other Christians to court. They're taking them to law. They're suing them. For them, Christianity is one thing, but business is another. And so he's dealing with that. You see, the carnal fruit of this is division. It's division over material wealth. Their concern over their own rights took precedence over their love for other people. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, 2, and 3, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then he goes on to say, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You see, before they were saved, their old manner of life was just taking people to court. They sued one another over the most trivial things. As a matter of fact, Argument and litigation was their way of life. One ancient writer wrote, in a manner of speaking, every Athenian was a lawyer. So the Corinthians had taken this selfish attitude into their Christian lives, and they were hanging their dirty laundry out for everyone to see. And Paul says, this is completely unacceptable. And it is, isn't it? It's totally unacceptable. When you read, even to this day, that a believer is suing another believer and I read it in the newspaper occasionally. It breaks my heart. And that's what Paul is dealing with. He had to deal with it 2,000 years ago in the church. But it's something that even today is still being dealt with. You see, for centuries, the Jews had settled all their disputes either privately or in what would be called a synagogue court. They refused to dispute before a pagan court because they believed that to do so would imply that God through his own people, using scriptural principles, was not able to solve their problems. And so the Jews would refuse to go before Gentile courts. They took care of it themselves in the synagogue before wise individuals in order that they might not bring God's name into disrepute amongst the non-believers. So Paul is dealing with this. Notice verse 1 how he begins. He says in chapter 6, Dare any of you having a matter against another Go to the law before the unrighteous and not the saved. If you could see his face as he was writing this, you'd see a man who was shocked and a man who was filled with sorrow. He's saying, why are you doing this? Why are you bringing your legal problems before unsaved people? Why are you so carnal as to not respect the authority of the body of Christ? Don't you realize that you are saints? When he says in verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? That word saints is a Greek word, hagios. It means to be the separated ones. And he's saying, don't you realize that you have been settled away from the world and settled unto God? You have been taken out of the world and you have been placed in the kingdom of God. And don't you understand that you can actually deal with this because you've been set apart? You're holy unto God and being led by the Holy Spirit, instructed by God's word. You should be able to render proper judgments without having to go to court and deal with it in that fashion. 
So he's asking them, can't you settle your own disputes without shaming the work of Jesus Christ? Christians are not to take other Christians before worldly courts. In doing so, we demonstrate more concern with worldly gain and our own pride. And that's why he asks in verses 2 and 3, don't you know that the saints will judge the world? Saints are going to judge the world by the fact that our presence is with the Lord Jesus Christ because we believed his message. And the angels who fell are going to be actually looked at by what we have done and realized that they have fallen. And as they have fallen, we have the right to, because we have believed the message, be present with God where they no longer have access to him. Our presence in heaven is going to validate the message of salvation. One of these days, and it's not that long, and I have to be honest with you, when I first got saved at the age of 20, I thought, well, it's a long time. 41 years later, one of these days, and not too long from now, all of us in this room, it's not that long, we'll see God face to face. We'll see him. We'll see him. We will see him. And I think the longer you walk with Jesus, the more real that becomes. The longer you walk with the Lord, well, the journey before you is a lot shorter than the one behind you. The days in front of you are a lot less than the ones that you've already lived. And so for me, I'm beginning to realize that. And by the way, I don't look at that like, oh, no, I'm getting old. You know, help me up, sit down on the stool. I, I, don't, I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way at all. I don't think my generation even understands what it means to be getting older, to be honest with you. And so fact is, it's not that kind of thing that motivates these words. What's motivating my words to you is 41 years of walking with Jesus Christ, realizing that each day that I live is one day closer to seeing him. And I want to be ready. I want to live a life that is prepared to see him face to face. I want to have this attitude that when I see him, I can say, I did it for you. I, I really did live for you. I, re I really was born again. I really walked with you. I had a relationship with you. I want to have that with all sincerity. There are some who will say, oh, yeah, I've got a relationship with God. And they go out and do whatever it is that they want because they, they use grace as an excuse to continue in sin. I don't want to be that way. Been that way. Been that way, learned about grace. Oh, you mean I'm going to heaven? Yes, you mean no good that I do is going to cause me to be any better in the standing of God? That's right. It's all that he's done for you. It's all his love for you. Oh, really? And I use that as an extension into my life of continuing in sin because, after all, God is so filled with grace. And then I began to understand what it cost God. When I began to understand what it cost him to save me, when I began to understand that my Jesus, my Jesus was beaten, his face became a bloody pulp. His, his beard was pulled out of his face. He was struck in the head with, with a reed. He, he had a crown of thorns, of thorns that were an inch long, that were pressed into his scalp through. His head was swollen. His back was lacerated open. It looked like hamburger. And he carried this cross that had these rough, rough uh, uh, splinters in him that, that when he put it on his open back and his wounds on his back, it, it would have been agonized. And not only that, he was nailed to it. And, and every time he took a breath and lifted himself off that cross so he could get some, some air into his lungs, his back would be lacerated over and over and over and over again as it was like rough sandpaper on this open wound while his mother's there watching him die. And I, I, I finally got hold of it. I finally realized that's what he did for me. And who am I to take that for granted, you see? Christianity isn't a philosophy. It is philosophic, yes, but it is not only a philosophy. Christianity is a way of life. It's a relationship with the living God who loves you and gave his son for you. And we live in response to that. What you have done for me is everything. What I do for you is very little. And therefore, be holy even as I am holy. Yes, Lord, I will be set apart for you. Because one of these days, and it's not that long, I will see you face to face. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, that where I am, you may be also. So I think of that. In Philippians 1, 21 through 23, Paul said it like this. He said, for to me, to live is Christ, 
and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You close your eyes here to open them up there and you see Jesus face to face. And so Paul is dealing with this and he's saying, listen, don't you understand the position you have? Don't you understand your presence in heaven judges all those who refuse the gospel? And yet here you are going to court. Look at, it verse, look at verse 4. If, if then you have judgments in, concerning uh, things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? It's interesting how he puts it here in verse 4. He speaks of those who are least esteemed. If you were to look at the original language there, least, least esteemed speaks of being utterly rejected. The question he's making here or asking is, how can you go to heathen courts and have your matters settled? You see their view of justice. How can you rely on the judgments of heathens who have no righteous standards? How can you do that? All you need to do is read the newspaper and see some of the judgments that are made in, in our time in our nation. And, and you'll understand exactly what Paul is talking about, where, where a Christian teacher is, is disciplined for having a Bible on her desk, and other school systems actually have set apart places for their Muslim students to go and do their washings and give them permission to go out and do their prayers, and, and, and you start saying, now wait a minute, I thought what is good for the goose is good for the gander, why are we, but that's how our nation is. Our nation is not judging by righteous standards. And so Paul is, and that was true then, so Paul is simply saying, listen, you need to understand these people's judgment is utterly rejected because they don't have righteous standards. They don't use the word of God and they're not led by the spirit. Yet you're trusting them in the matters and the affairs of your life. Why are you doing that? You see, he's saying, if you have a problem that ordinarily ends up in court, what you really need, and we call it this today, what you really need is Christian arbitration. We, we offer Christian arbitration here in this fellowship. Many churches that I know of have Christian arbitrators. What is that? Well, we have a believer, a mature believer or two, who meets with people who have disputations, and they seek the Lord, they seek scripture, there's a wisdom in them, and experience in them, and they try to find a solution between the two parties that will be able to be uh, honoring to God and fair to those who are involved. It's called Christian arbitration. It's been going on prior to Christian arbitration. As I said earlier, there was Jewish synagogue courts. And they had them then, even as we continue to this day. You see, there should be that rule in the church because of carnality and lack of accountability to the fellowship. You see, sometimes Christians are just not submitted to the judgment they receive from the church because they don't think that they're going to be treated fairly or they're not going to get what they want. And so they'd rather go to court and sue somebody sometimes for just small things. Normally it's related to money. They want more of it. So that's what Paul's saying. In verse 5, he says, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? Not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. They saw the law as more binding than integrity, unity, and a witness for Jesus Christ. Now, when Christian intervention is not effective, sometimes you're gonna end up in court. Sometimes people are gonna go through a divorce, and so they go before a, 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 a judge. They may have to go and get a restraining order against an abusive spouse. You have to get that from legal sources. But that's the exception. That's not the immediate rule. That actually ought not to occur either, but it does. He says in verses 7 and 8, it's already an utter failure that you're doing this. And then asks the question, why don't you rather accept wrong? Why don't you rather let yourself be defrauded? In other words, why do you take this matter into your own hands? Why don't you allow God 
room to move in this. Years ago, I sold a vehicle to somebody. And, um, you know, it was a truck. Marie was driving it to work. She worked as a uh, substitute teacher. When our church first began, we needed uh, income. And so the Lord was gracious. He gave Marie um, a position in Chino High School as a Spanish teacher. And so she taught Spanish, you know, one, two, and three. And I thought that was just really great because she doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> And at the end of the year, neither did her students, but that's, an, <laughs> that's another story entirely. <laughs> so during the course of our early years of the church, um, Marie would take you know, jobs as a, as a substitute teacher. And she was driving my truck one day. It was a 68 Ford. And, um, and her husband had forgotten to put oil in it. So it blew up on the side of the road. And uh, we had to go and tow it back to my house. And we had it in front of my house for some time. And somebody said, I'll buy your truck from you. And I said, great, we could, we could use it. I was still making payments on it. And it's just sitting there. I could, I could use that. And so uh, he came and towed the truck away and put a new engine in it and was driving it and drove it for several months. But there was just one problem. He never paid for it. He just decided to use it for work, and he drove it for some time. And so I'm still making payments on a vehicle that I'm not driving anymore, but it has a new engine in it, and somebody else is now driving it. What am I to do? Oh, what am I to do? Rawl, would you go beat him up? No, he wouldn't do it. <laughs> what can I do? You know what I did? I, 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 I left it in the hands of the Lord. I didn't do anything. I left it in the hands of the Lord. I just said, you know, Jesus, you know I need this money. You know we don't have any. You know that this is a, a brother in the Lord who hasn't chosen to, to honor his agreement. My option is to take him to court, small claims, or to let it go. I let it go. Now, months later, he came to my church. He, he didn't normally come to church here. He came to my church. And I'll never forget him walking up to me and handing me a check without a word of explanation, without an apology, nothing. He just handed me the check. And I took it, and I, and I praised the Lord, and I thanked him. Because God has a way of doing what needs to be done. Rather than taking it to court and making the name of Jesus look bad, I left it in the hands of the Lord. God knows my need. God knows I needed money to pay bills. God knew all of that. I took my complaint to him. But the Lord said, just leave it alone. I've got things I'm doing in his life right now. And, and I see that. And I get that from scripture. Paul said, why don't you rather be defrauded? Why don't you let it go? Why, don't you, why are you making such an issue over these things? Why don't you just allow God some room to move? He says, no, you yourselves do wrong and defraud, and you do these things to your brethren. So instead of striving to let God, instead of striving, let God do his work. Don't take matters into your own hand. Now he goes on into verse 9, and he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I, I underline these, this phrase, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. That's my responsibility, not to be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. And then he just gives a small list of a variety of sins. And he says, don't be deceived. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. We actually have to uh, teach this passage because there are people who are deceived. Notice what he's saying here. Do not be deceived through vain arguments to the contrary. What he's doing is he's revealing the character of the redeemed by contrasting it with the character of those who don't know God. And so don't be deceived by vain argumentation. 
You see, non-Christians will always argue against Christian morality. Uh, all you need to do is look at how we look at these words today. You see, fornicators today are simply lovers. Idolaters are experiencing authentic worship of God in a manner consistent with their culture. Adulterers are not shackled with puritanical, unreasonable, unnatural, monogamous immaturity and stifling ignorance of avenues of valid sexual expression. <laughs> homosexuals, he speaks concerning homosexuals. Homosexuals are, is literally effeminate. It was a boy who was kept for homosexual relations with a man, a male prostitute. It, it speaks of those who have corrupted normal male-female sexual expression and substituted various expressions of sexuality, which it includes uh, being a transvestite. It includes sex changes. It, it includes active homosexuality. These, these are all inferred. We, we are, oh boy, haven't we opened, you know, America has opened the door to that. I mean, you have a woman who's running for, uh, what is it, Mr. Universe, who's really a man. I, I don't even know why I called him a, a woman. It's a guy. It's a guy. I mean, that's what he is. I mean, come on. I mean, he's a guy. I don't want to think about that too long. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Trump was going to be sued by him. We opened the door, didn't we? We opened the door. We have athletes today, by the way, who are men who have had sex changes who are running track as women. And they're winning races, the champions, the champions. You know, it's just, it's unfair. It's just an unfair thing completely. I mean, if you get a male horse and you make him into a gelding, he's still a male horse. If you take the DNA sampling from these who are having sex changes, they're still genetically male or female. You can change the outside appearance, but they remain and retain their sexuality. You can, you can do all the implanting you want and you can you know, let the hair grow long and you can do the treatments to remove the beard or you can get the testosterone treatments for the woman to begin wearing the beard and um, they think it's outer appearance and, and unfortunately because we've opened the door to that kind of thing, there's a lot of confusion and an awful lot of pain going on because they are leaving the, the way that they were naturally created and the natural needs that their bodies have and they are changing them and they'll never be satisfied. They'll never be satisfied with that. They never will be. I've had more than one discussion with those who call homosexuality gay, and I say the, you can't re really refer to yourself as gay because if there's anybody miserable on the face of the earth, it's you. You know, the word gay used to mean joyful. It used to mean meaning filled with happiness. I mean, we used to sing songs, now, I don, now we don our gay apparel. I won't sing that song anymore. <laughs> yeah, could get me to do that. <laughs> Maybe when I'm home, but other than that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've changed words. And, and we think that by changing words, we can change nature, and we can't do that. And so Paul is saying, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Let me share something you already know, but it bears stating at this point. We older people are looked at as being beyond. They can't really change our minds. So who are they going after? They go after the youth. And where do they get the youth? They get them in in preschool. They get them in kindergarten. They get them in first, second, and third grade. They get them through school curricula that teaches certain things. That's why you know this. Some of you are in this age group. You know this. You can speak to a 17, 18, 19-year-old about issues of sexuality, and they are fully brainwashed into believing that homosexuals were born homosexual. They are fully brainwashed into believing that because they've heard that since they were kindergarten or first grade. And so for 13 years of their life, they've been taught that. And the only ignorant, backwoods, intellectual hillbillies who, who disagree are Christians. See, Christians are stupid. We don't have common sense. We, we're not sophisticated. We don't understand. And we're just some backwoods people. We don't even have all of our teeth. You know, and, and that, that's, not, you know that's what we are. And, and so, I mean, that has been, that's just how people look at us. And most of those who say things like that concerning you have never met you. 
They haven't met a, a real Christian. What they have done is they've allowed some straw men to be drawn for them, characterized by comedians and late night TV, and that's where they get their opinions. That's where they get their ideas. They get it from school teachers that, that don't know the Lord and are pushing curricula that, that, that presents this as fact. And I have asked, I have asked, can you produce one, one non-biased study, one, that presents homosexuality as genetic? Can you give me one? Is there such a thing? And the answer is no, there is no such thing. There is no such thing. There is no genetic study, there is no homosexual gene. And I have shared with them, I have shared, listen, I was born ethnically what I am. I am a Hispanic man. I use the term Hispanic simply because it's a generic term. I'm a Chicano, that's what I am. <laughs> but I have never seen a Hispanic make a decision to become Swedish. He may call himself Sven Lopez, but he's still, he's still a Mexican. Many years ago, I was teaching this passage, probably 20 years, over 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, I was teaching this passage. A young woman was in the church service, and she had come as a lesbian with her girlfriend to church. And she read this passage, and she saw what it says, and she went home with her girlfriend and told her girlfriend, we're in sin. I'm not living right. This is wrong. Her girlfriend says to her, oh, that was his opinion. That's what he believes. He's just backwards. She says to her girlfriend, uh-uh. Read it again. Read it. And they read it together. And as they read it, she said, God is not approving of my life. I'm in sin. Because you see verse 11, such were some of you sprang out of the page. You were this, but you're not that now. See, I was an alcoholic. But I'm not one well, now. I don't say, oh, I am recovering. I've been recovered for 41 years. You know, I'm not an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. Yeah, not anymore. I don't say, oh, I took a 12 step to get. No, I took one step to Jesus Christ. He transforms you. You see, that actually still happens. It does. It still happens. That still happens, right? It does. I've got a lot of people in here who can testify that. You were too. You were a fornicator. You may have lived a homosexual life. Yeah, that's what humanity is made up of, sinners. And he's, by the way, not saying this one's worse than that one. He's simply saying these are sins. He's not even giving the whole list. Just enough to convict us all in this room. <laughs> so she goes home and she reads the Bible. And she contacts me. And she tells me, Pastor, I want you to know I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. She, she stays here in this church, and then she moves to Oregon. And she's one of my Facebook friends to this day. Married, raising children, serving Jesus Christ, because such were some of you. But you're not that now. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in Jesus Christ. So he's given us a list. Yes, these, this list is speaking concerning sin. And he's saying, don't be deceived into accepting it. You will always have the various comedians on TV. He's not saying that because there was no TV. But you will always have people who will say these things to argue and make you feel stupid for believing God. But you're not stupid for believing God. Because God can set the captive free. God can change your life. You have been washed. The washing speaks of regeneration. We have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. We have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Sanctified. We've been set apart by God, by his word. See, if I didn't become a Christian, I was extremely liberal, like probably every one of you. Totally liberal. 
If you'd have come in and said, well, do you think it's wrong and named these things to me? Do you think it's wrong for someone to be a fornicator? I didn't even know what the word meant. I'd never even heard the word. I heard that the first time when I was in high school and I walked up to a girl and I asked her, what's a fornicator? Because I was reading it. She did not, she was not happy when I asked her that. She got all embarrassed. I didn't know what that was. I'd never even seen the word before. It's not in any of the comic books I read. And so fornicators, idolaters, I had a clue kind of what that was, kind of. Uh, adulterers, I was, I was more like, look, if you're not happy in your marriage, then find someone who makes you happy. What's the big deal? Homosexuality and the rest of those things, no, that wasn't, that wasn't something that I was in favor of, frankly. I, but I would have said, live and let live. What, why make a big deal? I mean, if that makes them happy, you know, that floats your boat. That's kind of where my attitude was. I wouldn't have made an issue with it. At this age, probably, if I'd have been hardened for another 41 years, I'd have probably said, you know what, that, you know, give them a right to get married so they can divorce like other people. That's kind of how I'd have thought. So, you know what changed my mind is the word of God, rightly divided. The word of God that sets you free. The blood of Jesus that washes you. That's what changed my mind. Being justified. Justification is a doctrine that speaks of us standing before God without sin. It's a forensic term. It speaks of being without guilt, as if you hadn't sinned. You stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is called imputed righteousness. It's given to you. He gives to you what you didn't have from his own resources. So what happened is you heard the gospel, the Holy Spirit convicted you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You awoke to the need for Christ. You said, God, be merciful to me, I am a sinner. God poured out his grace on you, washed you with his blood, poured his Holy Spirit into you. You became the temple of the Spirit of God, declared you to be not guilty imputed to you his righteousness, opened the doors to heaven and said, this is your home and I will welcome you here, based not on the works of righteousness which you've done, but I'm gonna base this on the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Spirit of God. You're gonna enter in, not because you're so good, you're gonna enter in because my son is so good and he took your place and God poured out his wrath on him. Judgment was poured out on Jesus Christ. Judgment that was really for me. He bore the full brunt of it, crying out to the Father, even on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? Experiencing the separation that sinful man experiences without God. Then he says, it is finished. And all of it is summed up in that moment. He bows his head. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Dismisses his spirit at the moment when it's all satisfied. Is buried for three days. But on the third day is raised from the dead for our justification. Demonstrating to us that our God is the God of the living and not the dead. And that he gives to us life. And I didn't become a Christian because my mom took me when I was four months old to some little church called the Plaza Church by Alvera Street. And like every Mexican in California, I got baptized there. <laughs> How many of you were baptized at the Placita? <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> but it wasn't the washing of this little baby body by water. It was the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ who cleansed me from all sin when I was 20 years old and I heard the gospel message that says, God loves you and God can transform you. God loves you. He can make you brand new. He can take all that sin and all that guilt and all that sorrow and all that grief and all that evil and those habits, he can take them from you and he can make you new. And I was standing, I was actually seated in a meeting 
few years ago now, Frank Pastore and I were invited to a meeting. And it was an issue related to whether or not homosexuality should, marriages, homosexual marriages should be allowed. And there were about 100 pastors in this room. And I was one of the last to speak. And I said, my sister Rebecca lived a lesbian lifestyle for almost 30 years. But my sister Rebecca gave her heart to Jesus Christ and has been transformed. And I shared that testimony. And turns out the woman who was hosting the dialogue had an assistant pastor, a woman who was a lesbian. And they didn't like that for some reason. They didn't like what I said. And they got, their faces got frozen. They were not real happy. They were horrified that I would say something like that. So some pastor in the local area spoke after me and he says, homosexuality is no big deal. It's only mentioned four times in scripture. And I turned and I looked at him and I said, how many times does God have to tell you something until you listen? God speaks once, you better listen. Four times, he's making a point. He's making a point. I mean, how many times do you tell your kid, come in? Four times, you lost him. <laughs> come in, no, die, they come in. <laughs> how many times does God have to say, he can forgive you? How many times does God have to say, I can wash you? How many times does God have to say, I can make you brand new? How many times does God have to say, I love you? How many times does God have to say, I love you this much? How many times until we finally hear it? And Paul is just saying, listen, it is wrong for you to take a brother or a sister to court. Why are you shaming the name of Jesus in front of the world? Why don't you have some wise believers who can use the scriptures and are led by the spirit so that Jesus' name is not run through the mud in the community. And I want to remind you of something. In a society that thinks that sin is just fine, I want to remind you that sin isn't. It's like leaven. A little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough. If you allow it to go unchallenged and not dealt with, it will infect the entire church. Deal with it. These are some of the sins that, that you used to be in bondage to. Don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that they're acceptable to God because they're not. You see, that was your former life, not your present life. You were once these things, but now you're new in Jesus Christ. So live as those who are new. Now that's, that's good stuff, I think. Live as though you're new.